My name is Colette Mazzuccelli. It is a pleasure, dear listeners, to welcome you to this Camp Rukban podcast episode, the latest in the LIU Global Connections Syrian Hidden Voices series, hosted by Olivia Stevens. During my time as a professor teaching for years on the diverse faculty of Long Island University, LIU Global, it is inspiring to me to encounter the revolutionary concept of world education, introduced by Morris Mitchell in his volume written after the Second World War. In World Education, Mitchell writes, one learns more quantitatively and thoroughly because the learning is acquired through the motivation of purposes beyond the learning itself. As we reflect on the fragile nature of interconnectedness in our present world, and the centrality of human security for the population inhabiting our planet, we realize that institutions of higher education may enhance learning in community during the uncertain time in which we live by listening deeply. Online learning in a classroom without borders can never substitute for the in-person, on-campus experience. The online community does not aim to replace face-to-face interactions. It is meant to introduce a diverse and plural encounter, one that welcomes distinct local knowledge to inform each virtual seminar that is taught. In this podcast episode, our aim is to discuss the humanitarian work of the Syrian Emergency Task Force, SETF, a 501c3 organization that engages on the ground in the country, notably in Rukban, a largely forgotten internally displaced persons camp that we purposefully visit in my LIU Global classes, learning across continents, in our research together in community, and in our mapping using Esri software. During the opening months of the Biden administration, We rely on the testimony of courageous Syrians, notably SETF Director of Detainees and Public Speaker Omar al-Shoghri, who appears before the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Foreign Affairs. As Omar speaks, we listen and learn about the humanitarian crisis and concerns during the ongoing conflict in Syria. In a different yet complementary way, This podcast episode aims to raise public awareness in conjunction with an Esri story map, which visualizes the plight of those Syrians displaced in conflict and brings their life stories to light. Thank you, dear listeners, for joining us on this LIU Global journey to discover Syrian hidden voices. Hello, dear listener, and welcome back to Global Connections, Syrian Hidden Voices. I'm your host, Olivia Stevens. Rukban Camp um, is an internally displaced persons camp located in southeastern Syria, um, where Syria borders Jordan um, and Iraq. And it is the location where the camp is itself is this sort of very arid desert um location where there's no you know major cities or towns or anything around um so it's pretty desolate um although i would note that the soil itself is actually fertile and so water could make a big difference at least in sort of mini gardening and things that can people can use to help sustain themselves but the camp itself is besieged because the Assad regime and russia um have completely closed off any routes to the camp from all of its surrounding sides and then the border with Iraq and the border border with Jordan are closed. The people of the camp mostly come from central Homs province uh, or Homs governorate in Syria. They mainly are sort of rural families or come from smaller villages uh, including around the town the historic ancient city of Palmyra and they initially had to escape the bombardment of the Assad regime um, right after the Syrian revolution had broken out. Um, Many of these people 
Um, obviously, like the majority of the Syrian people were protesting uh, against Assad and in his oppression, especially after the, the horrendous backlash against the beginning protests uh, back in March of 2011. And as they escaped the Assad regime sort of further east, um, then they had to also deal with the emergence of ISIS, which they also fled. And uh, the Syrian Emergency Task Force at multiple occasions had conducted um, small surveys of the camp mainly to understand why you know these people are where they are and almost if not every response came that they are here in this desolate internally displaced besieged camp because they are escaping um, the evil of the Assad regime and its terror and ISIS and its terror and so it's really I think powerful because it shows how you know ISIS and the Assad regime are sort of two sides to the same coin um, and how these people were desperate to leave. Now, initially, when a lot of this pop before the camp became established and the camp is now over five years old, um, initially they had been escaping and trying to cross over the border into Jordan. With the Jordanian government closing its border to any more refugees from Syria, they, ha they really couldn't find a way to get in. And, and many of them who initially tried to run away and sort of get out from southern Syria, just moved up that border with Jordan, um, you know, trying to find a safe place and ended up, because there was no access to Jordan, sort of setting up this ad hoc camp um, in the location I described earlier. Today, the camp's population initially was closer to 50, 60,000 over the years. And, you know, we, there's a lot to say about that, but the camp's population has been lowered now closer to 10,000 people. Of course, the vast majority of which are children um, and all the camp are, are civilians. So Rukban camp today is uh, completely besieged. They lack uh, educational facilities. They lack medical facilities. They rely uh, mostly on the smuggling of goods since all the borders are closed and they're under siege by the Russians and the Assad regime in Iran. Um, and they try to sort of, and there's been this sort of black market that's opened up to where people can try to pay, to, to buy, you know, things that are smuggled into the camp, like baby formula or, you know, any types of, you know, necessities, um, many of which sometimes are not found. And when they are, they're at exuberant prices. We have to remember because this camp is besieged, internally displaced, and in this location, um, there's also no commerce or or jobs in the camp itself. There's no way for people to make money, um, and so it's very difficult for the camp residents when food or something is smuggled into the camp and onto sort of the market. Um, you know, to be able to afford that is is, is not an easy thing. Uh, so finally, just to add, Rukban camp also sits within 10 miles from an American military garrison called Tanf, T-A-N-F. And the reason that this camp is in this location or remained in this location, the reason these people, these civilians internally displaced have, have been okay to stay here despite the fact that they're under siege, that they're in a desert, that they lack basic goods, that they can't educate their kids or go to a hospital, is because their greatest fear is to be captured by the Assad regime. Or of course, secondary to that being uh, having to deal with ISIS. Um, and so being in proximity, in close proximity to this military base of the international coalition, mainly U.S. servicemen and women, um, gives the, the people of the camp a sense of security, or it does give them real security. And so if you speak to camp uh, residents, they will say the reason we're alive, the reason we're protected is by the grace of God first, and second, the American military, uh, just for their mere presence there. Because the mere presence of that 10th garrison creates a 55 kilometer non-military zone, a safe zone for these people. And the U.S. military in the area works on the ground with a partner force uh, called MAT, short for Magawir Thora, that uh, also work to help secure 
this 55 kilometer area within which the camp exists. You mentioned that there um, is not a hospital or educational services in the camp. Are there any services other than deliveries or smuggling of goods that are provided? So the partner force uh, of the United States has a small clinic, uh, for lack of a better word, um, that has a nurse that staffs it, that is is there to help. You know, it's, it's for this partner force, but of course it also caters to residents um, because there's always need. Um, and the 10th garrison, like the American base, has its own clinic with a doctor, but that is that is not open to camp residents and civilians, except on very rare occasions. Okay, so um, there's this, uh, the, the 10th garrison itself has a medical clinic, but that is not open to camp residents. As a matter of fact, um, only in rare occasions where we had to sort of like put some pressure and advocate Um, was that used, for example, for cesarean sections for um, a couple of like emergency situations where, of course, in that clinic, the American base clinic, there is an American doctor uh, and so on. But again, that's kind of not the camps. Um, There used to be a medical point in Jordan where, again, when, when there were emergencies, people would be allowed to go there to seek treatment in return. But since the outbreak of the pandemic, uh, Jordan has since even closed off that one medical point. And there doesn't seem to be any indication that that medical point, at least for now, is going to be reopened. Um, in terms of schools, uh, oh, so the camp altogether, I think maybe has one doctor who's sort of a lab technician. Um, and there is a couple, there's like another nurse uh, we actually hired for the whole pharmacy. Um uh, that we opened. So there is a farm, a no cost pharmacy that recently opened in the camp by the Syrian Emergency Task Force. Uh, and we decided to hire a nurse because we wanted to be able to hopefully in the future evolve this into a clinic, not just a pharmacy, but definitely no medical expertise in, in the camp um, or, or hospitals to speak of. There are also, there's a lack of, you know, there's no high school, there's no, obviously no university or college or vocational school. There are um, sort of kindergarten uh, and like a sort of elementary school um, that's run, you know, by uh, by some people, um, but it's very little. And I, I can tell you when you ask the camp residents what they need, um, hospitals and schools are their number one thing. As a matter of fact, after we opened the Hope Pharmacy, uh, where we've been asked, you know, in time to try to open at least a kindergarten just to be able to educate the youngest kids, you know, since there's no other option. So that that in, in general, that's that's all they've got. So um, going back to the deliveries you talked about earlier, is the flour that is used to make bread, is that part of what is smuggled in? And then what is the usual delivery schedule? So there is no usual delivery schedule. The only way that the camp gets sustenance is through, you know, essentially smugglers that bring that in. Um, And so that really depends um, on the opportunities on what's available to buy because you can only smuggle or bring stuff in from Damascus. And smugglers and others are essentially reliant on the corruption of Assad regime military checkpoints and so on to be able to bring stuff in, which means that they usually have to like bribe a checkpoint or or something else to be able to, you know, go from Damascus into regime held areas. But there is no real rhyme or reason, you know, there isn't, yeah, there isn't like a, a, a set schedule. And there are times when these smuggling routes themselves are no longer available. Um, there are times where, you know, certain goods can be found or they're too expensive to even buy when they're brought in. Um, But there is a market in the camp that, you know, is more or less talked based on, you know, what people were able to to bring in. Um, And there are times where even the smuggling routes completely fail. And so you don't end up with, for example, the, the latest challenge the camp residents have had is flour um, to make bread and bread is 
is very much a, a very important stable um, for Syrian uh, for Syrians and and you know usually without it without bread rations without having that I mean people starve um, and and so that's been a challenge uh, but these are challenges that are consistent um, the camp is never well off it never has what they need uh, it never has all the medicine or food or nutrition that's needed um, baby formula is another thing that's uh, also important to have especially with malnutrition mothers that sometimes can't even you know produce milk for their kids and often rely on just giving them water and, and sugar if they have it um, so yeah there are no there's no regular schedule of aid coming in um, it's all sort of done essentially unofficially or, or, or in these different ways to, to provide food. And what we do as an organization, we've been operating in the camp for four years, is we try to consistently find ways to bring from Damascus food, medicine, uh, flour, oil, baby formula, other necessities, depending on, you know, what is the situation in the camp uh, and provide it at no cost to those in most need um, in the camp, those that have no income and, and can't buy anything from the market if anything is available in the market, but no set schedule. I wanted to ask, how can we help? How can we, you know, spread the news that Camp Rockba needs help? How can we get resources or hopefully aid in getting resources to the camp? Thank you for that question. First of all, I think uh, Camp Rockban is a forgotten camp. Uh, many people aren't sort of aware uh, of this camp uh, or its uh, horrific human rights, you know, or humanitarian situation. This camp has no, like the, the United Nations has no access to it. There are no major NGOs uh, that are operating there. It really does rely on the kindness of people that learn about it and then help. And the way that we've been able, we as the Syrian Emergency Task Force, which is a nonprofit organization based here, um, have been operating in the camp uh, a lot of times sort of by ourselves. And what we do is on a monthly basis, we have a food drive where we bring in bread when we can, um, milk, baby formula, uh, oil, necessities for people to survive uh, or receive nutrition. Um, and because of our experience in working in the camp for so many years, we have been able to find a system to bring in um, this, this much needed help uh, and provide it directly to camp, uh, to, to the residents, to the civilians living in this camp. We also opened a pharmacy as of uh, a couple of months ago, which is a no cost ph pharmacy where we hired a nurse um, and we are trying to get expertise here, people like doctors and medical experts here and workers here that can give advice and consultation on how to use certain medicine or how to deal or treat uh, uh, a particular patient that may walk into our pharmacy. In order to sustain the pharmacy, um, it's taking us about, you know, a thousand dollars a month just to have uh, to pay the salaries of the staff and to make sure that we have uh, we have it stocked with medicine. Again, it's not easy nor cheap to bring medicine into a besieged camp, um, but it is it is vital. Uh, and the the general aid, whether it is warm clothes, sorry, the general aid, whether it is warm clothes or food or and, and so on. Um, we also do that on a monthly basis, and that's usually uh, also, you know, between five hundred to a thousand dollars. Again, this is not enough to sustain the whole camp, but we aim it uh, and direct this aid to those poorest in the camp um, that can't even afford to buy something from the camp's market if they were able to find it there. Um, and there is also a media center. Um, in the camp, which we help establish, called Voice of Rukban. On Twitter, it's at Voice of Rukban. On Facebook, it's The Voice of Rukban. And what this is, is the unfiltered, direct voices of the people on the ground that tell uh, tell the world, um, and, and these are all videos in, in 
uh, they're in Arabic, but they're subtitled in English, uh, what they need, why they're suffering, what the solution is uh, for them. And so the first thing that I would say if people want to help is follow Voice of Rukban um, and donate to this besieged camp where nobody, no NGO is operating um, except ours. Uh, you can donate through the SyrianTaskForce.org. And after you put in your amount for the donation, choose Rukban in the drop down menu. This will allocate 100% of the funds donated towards food, medicine, baby formula, and support uh, for the people of Rukban. Um, the second, I would also incur it, the same applies sort of for the Hope Pharmacy. Um, I would also encourage people to to follow Voice of Rukban, um, but also to raise awareness about it. Um, the more people speak about this camp and highlight that at least now 10,000 civilians are in, you know, at risk of starvation or don't have medical aid, have zero education. Um, I think it's it's really um, important that people highlight and raise awareness about this camp. And finally, on a policy level, because this camp is besieged and there is no humanitarian corridor or cross-border aid into it, I think it is the obligation of the United States, which has a military garrison less than 10 miles away from the camp, which has a partner force that works with us to fight our adversaries that's often recruited from the camp, that we either provide uh, direct sustained aid to the camp that allows them not to rely on smuggling or this black market or starvation, um, but gives them a chance to survive and, and, and have some semblance of a normal life in the camp. Or if we're unable to provide sustained aid to the camp or open a road that allows the camp uh, residents to, you know, have doctors or medicine or open schools or have any sort of, um, you know, humanitarian aid or trade or commerce where they've lived now for five years, then allow them to be transferred or help transfer them to any area in Syria that is not under the Assad regime's control which is these camp residences' worst nightmare. Today, if somebody in the camp wants to leave anywhere, the only option that they have is returning to Assad regime controlled areas, which essentially means for these camp residents that they will be forcibly conscripted, extrajudicially killed, uh, detained in some of the worst dungeons and, and prisons in, in the world, or a best case scenario, be kept at holding centers um, with an uncertain future. And people have only taken this huge risk of returning to Assad regime controlled areas when they were so desperate, either their baby was starving or you know one of their family members is extremely sick and there's maybe 1% chance that if they return to Assad regime controlled areas, their loved one might be able to seek medical attention. Um, so this very, very desperate situation demands raising awareness. It demands generosity, humanitarian aid to the Hope Pharmacy or to just the, the regular food and uh, drive uh, that, that we sent to the camp through the Syrian Emergency Task Force, but also advocating with your representatives in Congress um, or uh, with the White House and the State Department calling for uh, a solution to the camp of either providing them direct aid or allowing them to go to a place where they're not uh, in danger of detention or death, um, which is so anywhere in Syria that is not Assad regime controlled areas. But um, these are ways that people can support and help. Taking the time to be with us uh, to share your insights on this uh, LIU Global podcast uh, today. Uh, on behalf of our host, Olivia Stevens, this is Colette Mazzuccelli with Muaz Mustafa, Executive Director of the Syrian Emergency Task Force, saying thank you to our listeners, and we look forward to our next podcast. Be well. <laughs>